Hello and welcome to Accountant Instruction Help and How To. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about inflation, deflation, and policy related to inflation and deflation. At the end of this, we will be able to explain the definition of inflation, describe the ways to measure inflation, explain costs of inflation, describe quantity theory of money, and explain the Phillips curve. Starting off with inflation and the definition of inflation is a continuous rise in the price level and it's measured with a price index. So obviously what that is going to mean is that if we purchase something today as compared to something we purchased a year ago, even if it's the same thing and the value has not gone up, the item will cost more today due to inflation. So the item didn't go up, the purchasing power of our dollar went down, purchasing power of the dollar going down over time is inflation, meaning that if we buy the same level of things, it's going to cost more over time, and that will be the idea of inflation. When we measure inflation, as we will see, there's going to be a difference between goods price inflation that we measure. We basically measure the prices of goods and services as opposed to assets. So goods and services are going to be things that we consume basically this time period. So when we buy them, we're consuming them now in this, in this time period. That's the inflation that we are generally measuring as opposed to things that we are purchasing in this time period that are basically going to be assets, long-lived assets. And there's a cost to that. So the difference of that would be then assets are going to be things like homes or if we purchase gold or we purchased artwork or collectibles. Those are things when we think about assets, sometimes we think about investments and just think about stocks and bonds, which are included in assets. But our home is an asset or you know, any type of thing that we're buying in order to hold wealth either for today or help us generate revenue into the future is going to be a type of asset. Those types of things are not included in our inflation calculation for a couple of reasons. One is it's just it's kind of difficult to include those things into an inflation calculation. And two, it was thought that those two things will kind of move in tandem. And therefore, if we can have the, the goods and service inflation, then the asset price inflation will move somewhat in tandem. Of course, meaning at the same time. So the rates will be somewhat going in the same direction. So as long as we can measure the goods and services inflation, then we would also have a relatively reasonable measure of the uh, asset price inflation. Now, in 2008, of course, we had this, the housing bubble related to asset, the asset of housing. And that kind of disproved that theory that these things move in tandem. They could move out of tandem for a, a long period of time. It's also argued that it's been argued that basically asset price inflation will have an inflationary period and have a deflationary period and that those two will kind of even out over time. There's going to be a time of, of asset price inflation, a bubble and a decline, deflation, actionary price uh, level, and the two will even themselves out. But again, in 2008, we kind of saw that that's not always the case. And we've seen multiple examples of the, of the fact that these bubbles can cause a lot more harm to the economy in the deflationary period than they cause benefits in the inflationary period because people act differently within the inflationary period. When we're in a time of asset inflation, people tend to have incentives to be more risky. For example, if there was, when there was a housing bubble and we had an asset price inflation, that means people have more, quote, equity in their house, even though it's going to be an increase in uh, just inflationary bubble and when there's more equity in the house people have incentives then to take out more loans against that equity and invest more money based on this inflationary uh, bubble so they're going to make decisions that they would not have made if we didn't have the inflationary bubble and if if their perception of the bubble is that the asset price increase is going to continue over time which clearly it was for many people then they're going to they're going to have decisions that are going to be made that would not have been made if there wasn't an inflationary bubble. More uh, people that are more risk averse then might be looking at the uh, inflationary times and saying that prices are over uh, inflated in terms of an asset bubble and maybe may be not willing to invest. But as a whole, it probably it, this time period of an, an inflationary bubble in terms of asset prices will often lead to benefit people during that bubble time that are more risky investors. Then when there's a decline, it would be seem that the decline is more costly than the benefit of the increase. It's more painful during the, t the decline period than the benefit was during the, the bubble period because the decline people have to have to account for those long term decisions that they made prior that they can't really fall through on at this point in time. So if, if someone made a decision to purchase a house and now their house is underwater, 
uh, then it's a lot more difficult for someone to then undo those very long-term difficult decisions, those, those long-term decisions after they have been made. So that would lead to the idea that the, the bubble does cause major problems within uh, the economy. The next question is going to be how do we measure inflation? How do we measure the increase in prices? What we will be using is going to be some type of a price index. A price index is a number that summarizes what happens to a weighted composite of prices of a selection of goods over time. What that means is that we're going to pick basically a selection of goods. We'll talk about what those goods may be in a bit. Once we have those goods, we're going to measure the price index at a base year time. We will then look at a later time and look at the change in that set of goods. So we have the same set of goods in year one, same set of goods in year two. The price will then change, although the value didn't change because the basket is the same. Therefore, the change in price level must be due to some type of inflation. That's going to be the idea. Now, it's not a perfect calculation, of course, because we're not measuring everything in the economy. We are taking some type of basket. We're basing that basket on consumable goods and we're measuring the difference within that basket and of course that difference then that increased level is what we're going to be applying in terms of inflation as a whole to all goods and services therefore what is in that basket can be quite significant because as we know tastes change over time and the and the typical basket in year one may be a bit different than the typical basket in year two now there's going to be different types of indexes that we can often look up and use in practice one is going to be the consumer price index that's going to be given monthly so that one is given monthly we can look at it more real time one that's often thought to be more accurate is going to be the gdp deflator this is going to be a calculation that is thought to be more accurate but it takes more time to compile and therefore if we want the numbers soon and in terms of recent numbers we probably want to use the consumer price index in terms of recent numbers there's also one called the personal uh, consumption expenditure and the advantage of this one is that it tries to take into account the fact that people's tastes change it's going to take into account the fact that the the basket of goods does change over time if we want to just see a, ba a basic calculation of how these types of indexes could work and if we just compare two years then we're saying year two that's the current year we're in we want to compare that to last year if we're trying to look at the price of something last year and compare it to this year we can't just look at that price because, of course, that doesn't take into account the fact that inflation has happened, meaning the value of the dollar has gone down, it takes more dollars to buy the same value of stuff. We want to take that out of the equation when we're trying to compare things over time. That's going to be the point. Therefore, if we took some basket of goods, if we took a basket of goods that includes things like clothing and consumption and entertainment and that type of consumable goods, some type of basket, and we looked at it current year, this year, compared it to last year in terms of total price, same basket, then we can see what that increase is going to be. For example, if we said that the current year we had in our basket $675 worth of goods, and last year we had $540 worth of goods, if we take the current year total price of the basket divided by last year's total current price of the basket, so $675 divided by $540, $1.25. What that means is there's a 125% increase in essence. So any price that we would take in the prior year, we would multi multiply times 125% or 1.25 in order to get it to current year dollars, in order to get it comparable to current year dollars. We can also think about that calculation if you wanted to think about the change. Uh, we could say that we have the difference then. It's this year the same basket, 675, and last year minus last year, 540 means there's a $135 increase in total dollars for the same stuff. It costs $135 more for the stuff. Now we need to think about that in terms of a percentage increase in this case, or that's the way one way we can compare this. So if we take that number and divide by the original 540, it's 0 0.25 or a 25% increase. 25% increase. So if we look at anything in terms of the price from the prior year, we have to increase it by 25% meaning we could multiply it times 100, 100%, or 125. So we take any number times 
125% because of the 100 current and the 25% increase, and that could give us our current number. What type of things are in the consumer price index? So remember, these are things that are consumable goods. These are not going to be long-lived assets. We're talking about consumable goods and measuring what is being consumed within a particular time period and comparing that basket over time. The consumer price index can include about a 15% of foods and beverages, about a 4% apparel, transportation, about 17%, uh, Medicare, about 7%. Recreation, about 6%. Education, communication, about 7%. Other, about 3%. And housing in terms of rent, actual consumption of housing, 41%. What's the effect of inflation on the economy? Now, we can think of the effect of inflation in terms of what if it was unexpected and what if it is expected. If, if there's unexpected inflation, meaning if we thought the economy is going to run fairly smoothly, and then there's a period of inflation that was not expected, there's going to be some winners and some losers in terms of that type of scenario. For example, if we think that things are going to be fairly steady within an economy, we feel fairly comfortable in making long-term contracts, long-term contracts with steady interest rates, and if there's not a lot, a lot of variation, we feel comfortable with those long-term contracts. If, for example, we had an, an a, n agreement where a lender charges 6% and expects inflation to be 2%, then they are expecting a real rate of return at 4%, meaning they're charging 6%, but they expect 2% of that is inflation, so they're really getting 4%. However, if inflation is actually 4% in the future, rather than the expected 2%, then rather than get a 4% uh, rate of return, real rate of return, they're only getting a 2% real rate of return. Why? Value of money went up. So if we're looking at the long-term contract and there's unexpected inflation that wasn't in, implanted into the contract, what then happens is the lender is not doing as well. They lose in that scenario. The, borrow, the borrower makes out. You can imagine a time if you're, if you're buying a house and you have a large mortgage on the house, if the mortgage rate is a fixed mortgage rate and it's fixed, then an unexpected increase in terms of inflation happens and we still have that fixed rate the borrower makes out in that in that particular situation the lender does not the distribution effects in terms of inflationary time periods can depend in terms of who is predicting the inflation if we do predict the inflation then the winners are going to be the people that can vary their contracts as the uh t as the inflation hits if we can adjust the contracts in order to account for inflation then we're generally going to often be better off if we know the inflation is going to happen if we're in a in an area where we have hyperinflation hyperinflation being like in the triple digits this is something that's typically thought to be very damaging to an economy the u.s hasn't had hyperinflation we have had high inflation for the u.s on average but we haven't had hyperinflation where we're basically in triple digits and we can imagine what would happen we've seen other countries be in triple digit inflation we can imagine ourselves how we might act if we had inflation that was that high we can think that things would not be that uh, secure we wouldn't have that much reliability in order to make long-term contracts but if the hyperinflation if we predict that that's going to happen then we do have then we might have a little bit more predictability in terms of what's going to happen in terms of just a really high inflationary time period and it is possible to put in systems in place to account for some of that high inflationary time period. But you can imagine that if you're going to get paid today and we know that the price of bread tomorrow is going to go up significantly just in one day, what's going to be the behavioral results of that? We're probably not going to save too much, at least in that currency. We're probably going to buy a lot more and spend a lot more as soon as we get uh, the currency. What's not going to happen is we're probably not going to move away from the currency altogether because if we did that, we'd have to go to bartering or we would have to go to some other type of uh, use of currency. We, some of that might happen, but we probably wouldn't eliminate the use of the currency altogether. If hyperinflation happens for a long time, it is possible to put some uh, controls within the system. People will start to depend on hyperinflation. They'll start to put in systems and make contracts that will take into account the fact that they expect hyperinflation to happen. So it is possible for an economy to move forward with hyperinflation, but it does seem to be very, it would be very damaging in, in any case to have that hyperinflation. And of course, that's something we typically would like to avoid. We know that expectations play a big role on the economy and expectations in terms of inflation will play a big role on the economy. How do people expect what will happen in terms of inflation within the future? 
couple different perspectives on that. People may look at the rational expectations in terms of economic models. They may be, and that's what usually economists, classical models will predict, that people have all the information, that people use the economic models, and that people will make predictions based on the economic models. But in actuality, people probably might be making decisions in other formats, meaning they're probably using past history in some way to make current decisions. That's the way typically human beings make decisions. We look at what happened in the past, and we make some kind of projection into the future. For example, we might have some kind of adoptive uh, objective position based on what has happened in the past. So if there's a 4% interest rate and then a 5% interest rate, we might take some average of that is going to be in the future. Or we might say that the trend is going to continue. It's 4%, it's 5%, it's going to be 6%. Some kind of prediction on what happens in the past. But whatever that method is, it's important in terms of an economic model because expectations change uh, the outcome. We can think of inflation as the result of productivity and wages, the difference between productivity and wages. In a formula, we can predict this in terms of inflation being equal to the nominal wage increases minus the productivity growth, meaning that wages are going to be used to in order to purchase things. And therefore, if the nominal wages are greater than the actual productivity growth, meaning wages are going up at a higher pace than the productivity is going up, what we're actually making, then that would ha lead to a period of inflation because there's more wages out there. There's less actual productivity out there. If, however, wages are going up less than the growth in productivity, that could lead to a period of deflation because now we're at a period where wages are going to be less out there and the productivity is actually higher. We'll now talk about some theories of inflation, meaning why does inflation happen? What is the cause of inflation? We're going to look at our oldest model for a theory of inflation. That's going to be the quantity theory of money and inflation. Happened around the 1600s, so it's a relatively old model. The basis of the model is basically going to say that inflation is called by caused by changes in the money supply. So if the money supply goes up, then we could have inflation. If money supply does not go up, uh, we should not have inflation. So when inflation happens, always going to be the result of the money supply in the classical view of the quantity theory of money. Now recently, a lot of people have kind of abandoned that classical view, that hard view that it's always going to be just the money supply and not have any other factors involved. And there is evidence that we'll take a look at to deviate from that classical view. But the model still is applicable and we'll talk about where it's applicable and where there might be some uh, deviations as we go through this. The quantity theory of money does say that inflation is due to changes in the money supply and therefore if that is the case the focus then would be according to this model on long-term growth. That's basically more of a supply side model. So the quantity theory of money centers on the equation of exchange. We're going to take a look at this equation. It's a fairly simple equation. It's usually expressed in terms of m times v equals p times q m stands for quantity of money so the quantity of money how much money is out there times v which is going to be the velocity of money meaning how many times does the dollar each individual dollar circulate within the economy we can imagine if there's an economy of only like a hundred dollars out there and we say that it circulates all those hundred dollars circulate in the economy within a year ten times well that hundred dollars then did the work of a thousand dollars within the economy so the money supply times the velocity is going to be equal to P times Q, which is going to be price level times the quantity. So we're going to have the price level out there times the quantity of real goods that are going to be sold. That then will equal the price level times the quantity will equal the nominal GDP. So the money that's out there times the velocity, how much it goes around, is going to be equal to the, to the price level times the quantity, which is our production. That's, that's the nominal GDP that we have out there. So notice what that means. That means that if we had our $100 out there and we said that it's going to circulate 10 times, then we have the money supply times the velocity being 1,000, and that's going to be equal to P times Q, or that 1,000 is going to be our nominal GDP, our actual output. If this equation is true, we can also determine what the velocity is by taking P times Q, which is the GDP. We can take the GDP and divide it by the money supply. So if we just manipulate the algebra and we take the GDP, the P times Q, which is the GDP, and divide it by the money supply, then we can get the velocity, meaning 
how many times that money is being exchanged within the economy. Now, there are some assumptions that are going to be made within the quantity theory of money. When we look at this equation, we usually make the assumption, the classical view is to make the assumption that velocity, the velocity of money that we said it circulates 10 times within the year, is going to stay relatively constant. So the classical theory would hold the velocity of money relative, relatively constant. And, and that may not be the case currently. We may have times where the velocity could change due to changes in the economy. For example, if we, if we have people that are living closer to certain areas, closer to stores, they may be able to spend more uh, frequently. Things like online trading and things like that could start to change the velocity of money, how many times that money is circulating within the economy. The next assumption that's going to be made in the classical view of the quantity theory of money is that Q remains constant, meaning the real output that is actually out there is remaining constant. So it's not going to be affected by banking type of activities where there's increases and in decreases in the money supply. The idea is that Q is separate from the money supply. And if that's the view, that's why the classical model basically is geared towards long-term growth, more of a supply side growth model because the short-term banking assumption is basically being kept separate, meaning the, mo the money supply uh, angle of things, the side of things, is, be is basically being separated from the actual output, long-term growth, actual output side of things. Now, given those two assumptions, if we look at our classical equation here, we're going to say the money supply times the velocity equals the price times the quantity, and we have now held the velocity constant, where the, the classical view is that the velocity on the left-hand side is held constant, and the quantity on the right-hand side is held constant. Therefore, what are the things that can basically change at this point in time? Well, the money can change. How much money on the left-hand side is the variable factor, the thing that can change? And on the right-hand side, we have the price of things that can change. So that's what's left in our equation in terms of the classical view, in terms of what can change. And now there's the question, well, what's the cause of an effect? Is it the, the money that's going to drive the, the prices of goods and services to change? Or is it the price of goods and services that are going to cause the money to change? And again, the classical view is that the money supply is going to be the causing factor, meaning if the money supply goes up, then on the right side of the equation, prices will go up, meaning there's going to be inflation due to increases in the money supply and vice versa if the money supply goes down. Now, there's some economists that don't believe, don't agree with that. They basically are of the opinion that price is the thing that's going to change, and firms have a tendency to increase prices. They have a lot uh, less of a of a ability to lower prices. They they tend to be kind of sticky on the on the increase side and not tend to go down. And therefore, the money supply kind of follows those increases in price levels in order to keep up with those price levels. So there's kind of a debate on the cause and effect. The quantity theory of money has obviously had some problems in current times because of the fact that the vo velocity of money has not been remaining constant in current times. And the connection between increases in money supply and growth of goods inflation has, has not been the case in all, in all circumstances in recent times as well. So some of the assumptions that we have looked at are not holding uh, in terms of the classical view of the money supply. Now, what does this mean for our equation? It doesn't mean the equation is not relevant. It just, it just means there's some more factors involved here that could complicate the picture a bit. One, what if velocity isn't constant? Meaning we, we assume that $10, uh, 10 velocity, meaning the dollar was exchanging 10 times and each dollar was doing the work of about $10. Well, what if that velocity goes up to 20 or something like that? That's basically going to be similar to the idea, well, if the money supply increased. So if the money supply increased, it would, it would increase the left-hand side of the equation, but so would an increase in velocity. If that money becomes more efficient in some ways, meaning it's circulating faster than it otherwise has been, then that can have the same effect. What does this mean for us in terms of using this equation? This is going to mean that basically if there's, say, a 4% growth in GDP, we can then say that the velocity of money, how many times the money exchanges, as well times the amount of money out there has got to be at 4% uh, growth and there shouldn't be any inflation if that is the case. If both the velocity changes or in is increased times the money supply is going to be greater than the actual output, the actual GDP, those could have inflationary pressure, meaning velocity of money in and of itself, if it increases substantially, can uh, produce inflationary f pressure as well as the actual uh, printing of more money 
and having more money within circulation could have inflationary pressure. The idea of inflation is often also compared to the idea of unemployment. So inflation and unemployment can be related and this is often shown traditionally with what is known as the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve usually is graphed as having unemployment rate being on the x-axis or horizontal axis and inflation on the vertical axis and we can imagine a downward sloping Phillips curve. So we have a Phillips curve downward sloping. We have inflation on the vertical y-axis. We've got unemployment rate on the horizontal x-axis. This relation indicates that when we have relatively low inflation, we're going to have relatively, I mean, we're going to have relatively high unemployment and vice versa. When we have relatively high unemployment, we tend to have relatively low inflation. Therefore, the relationship between unemployment and uh, inflation is going to be an inverse relationship. So as one goes up, the other tends to go down. That was the short run view in terms of the Phillips curve. From a policy perspective, what that meant is that when we wanted to tackle inflation, we had to be willing in order to tackle inflation, meaning lower inflation, to be willing to have a bit higher unemployment rate. And when we wanted to tackle the unemployment, we tended from a policy perspective to have to deal with the fact that inflation was likely to rise. In the 1970s, we ran into a problem with the concept of the Phillips curve because we had a period of stagflation, a period in which we had both high unemployment and high inflation. So this was a period that tended to not be in correlation with the concept of the Phillips curve. That was a period of what we call stagflation. The attempt to explain this problem with the Phillips curve is to have a short-run Phillips curve and then to have the long-run Phillips curve. So if we had that long-run Phillips curve, we would represent this not by a downward sloping line, but at a vertical line, meaning we'd have a vertical line at uh, employment. We can imagine this by basically seeing that, imagining that we are on a point in a graph where we have, are at natural rate of unemployment. And remember that natural rate is where we just tend to be in terms of an economy because we tend to have some people that won't be employed just either uh, by, by circumstances, switching jobs and whatnot. We don't know exactly what that point is, but if we believe we are at the point of natural unemployment around 5%, and the inflation is, uh, the productivity is correct at that point in time, and the government puts in policy that is meant to lower unemployment, it's argued that this decrease in unemployment will also cause inflation. That means that the people that are in the market are kind of fooled in the short run to be thinking that the inflation is actually below what it actually is. It's actually been increased due to the policy. As people start to realize that there's really inflation within the economy, people are going to do things like ask for raises in order to keep up with the real rate of inflation, and that will push up the short-run Phillips curve. As the Phillips curve gets pushed up in this way, we have this pressure to push up the Phillips curves. That's going to increase the unemployment rate, and this pressure will keep on happening until we get back to basically that natural rate of unemployment. We were at the potential output. <laughs>